Well, we have been in uh, Gal- the book of Galatians uh, for the last, well, this is uh, week number six. And um, I've had a chance as um, Jordan and Brenda and Tyler Hartford have, uh, have done some of the teaching. I've had a chance to just absorb a lot of what was being uh, taught, a lot of the, uh, the uh, scripture, uh, allowing it to permeate uh, my thinking and my, um, my soul, quite frankly. And um, I found Paul, as you all might have found Paul, as he's writing this, uh, this, this book, um, he's writing to the Galatians, um, and, and the Galatian church has been in this predicament because they had, first of all, received the good news and had changed their lives. And then uh, some of the uh, more, more Jewish, uh, the Jewish people would come in and the, they called them the Judaizers, came in and said, no, 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 you got to do this, this, and this. You got to follow the rules. There's all kind of the legalistic uh, actions that they promoted as the way to God. And so Paul is writing this chapter and, or this book. And, and I found, uh, as you may have, that so much of this feels really strident It feels like in your face, and it's because he meant it to be. He meant it to be a book that brings correction. It didn't didn't, uh, have very much affirmation in it at all. It doesn't have much affirmation. But here now, we come into chapter 6, and Paul seems to turn a corner a bit. And what I'm seeing as I read this and what am I experiencing even in my own life as I read this is as a renewed uh, sort of just appreciation for the hard work that Paul has done with the church of Galatia and quite frankly for you and I today. This word is for you and I today as well. But I see Paul now beginning to be a little more empathetic. I hear him um, He's been pointing toward grace, but now he begins to speak graciously. And he begins to speak with a deeper, uh, uh, should I say, like uh, there's, there's more love evident. So he comes from a place of love. He comes from a place of grace. And yet he has to have this hard word. And now he begins chapter six. And one of the things that has happened with me over the course of this time, and by the way, like if you know me at all, you know that what happened outside with the weather this week is in my past life. I would be up here complaining right now. My past life was just last week, but <laughs> I told Brenda, I'm like, Paul calls us and Jesus calls us to have a renewed mind. I'm determined to have a renewed mind in this area of my life. Thank you. I'm going to speak well of snow and cold. And I'm going to, I just am determined. I'm going to learn how to, how to live into it without complaining. And, um, and so uh, that's one of the things that has happened with me over the course of uh, reading the book of Galatians again and, and understanding how, how much we have to do Our thinking has to do with how we live our lives. And so Paul begins, and he begins in chapter 6 with a, a word that reads like this. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly, and by, yeah, I was gonna say, some of you have been more godly than me when it comes to the complaining part, so you have tried to help me with this. You who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Hey, I wonder this morning if you are paying attention to the right things. Are you like me taking stock of your thought processes? Because that's where it all starts, how we think. Are you paying attention to the right things? Are you living into the freedom that Christ offers? These are, these, this book, this book of Galatians speaks over and over and over about the freedom that is ours when we follow Jesus. Are you living into that freedom? Are you striving to perform or are you believing in the sufficiency of Christ? Are you still trying to do all everything right? Are you a perfectionist by nature? 
and you haven't quite given that over to Jesus and allowed him to take that and form it into excellence, If another believer, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly. Here's what I love about what Paul is saying. Paul has been so in our face, and now he says, hey, be gentle and humble to the one that has slipped away. Be gentle and humble with the one that needs encouragement instead of discouragement. In fact, For you and I, as we connect with people, it's significant and important that we actually declare that we will be people, be people of encouragement, that we won't be people of discouragement. When we make a declaration along those lines and we commit, God honors that. And God comes alongside us and helps us maintain that commitment. We want to be people that are blessing instead of cursing. As we come alongside people, it is easy to see their faults. It is easy to see the things that they're doing that fall short of where we believe they should be. But let's bless and encourage, not discourage or curse. And I believe this morning that we are people of grace. We received grace through the death of resurrection of, and resurrection of Jesus, and we should be people that will release grace, that we release grace everywhere we go. You know we have the opportunity every single moment to release grace, and sometimes we need it ourselves. We need to release grace to ourselves. Receive grace and release grace. In verse two of chapter six, Paul writes, share each other's burdens and in this way, obey the law of Christ. So what is the law of Christ? The law of Christ is love. Love conquers all. Love is the law of Christ. Legalists, which the Judaizers were, they loved to legislate. But healthy Christians, we come alongside. We walk with people. We walk with those that have fallen away. We walk with those who have stumbled. We come alongside and we do so until their spiritual restoration is accomplished. We don't, it's not just a flash in the pan, but it is, it is the sort of thing where we have longevity with people. We must come alongside and restore. Verse three, if you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. And Paul says, you're not that important. Paul says, check your, check your ego. Make sure that you know the truth about yourself. I had a conversation a week or so ago uh, with, with, with someone that is, uh, from all, uh, for all intents and purposes, from my perspective, they're winning. They're winning at life. They're winning in their career. They're winning all across the board. And yet he, that person looked at me and he said, I don't feel like I'm winning at anything right now. I don't feel like I'm winning at anything right now. And so we were able to have a conversation about what are the lies he's believing about the things that he is saying is true about him. Because there are some things that he's saying is true, are true about him that really aren't. So what are those things? What are those lies? What are the fears that were raised in that moment and in your moments when you believe the lies that are not true. Because, you know, when we believe lies, we actually diminish our effectiveness with other people. When we believe lies about who we are and we discount what God has done in us, our effectiveness is diminished when we're in relationship with other people. So if we want to come alongside people, which God calls us to come alongside each other, Paul says very clearly here, come alongside Be with people. Encourage. Don't discourage. We are at our best when we ourselves are healthy and are believing the truth about who we are. So we look out for each other. Each section of scripture this morning, I've kind of given it a title. This next one is uh, verses four and five. Mind your own business. Mind your own business. You know what? Here's how it reads. Pay careful attention to your own work. For then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. For we are each responsible for our own conduct. Mind your own business. Hey, pay attention. 
Pay attention to what's going on around you. We get into this comparison trap, don't we? Where we feel like, well, I'm just not measuring up. Again, what are the lies you're believing about yourself? But when you don't compare yourself to anyone else, that's when you are paying careful attention to your own work. Now, this last verse, for we are each responsible for our own conduct, means just take responsibility for yourself. And some of us, I'm afraid, have allowed the people who have spoken into our lives to have more control than they should have. Maybe we felt insignificant in the job that we're doing, in the service that we're giving in the local church or wherever you serve. In fact, I think some of us have, uh, have stepped into spiritual retirement because somebody somewhere, a Christian somewhere, did something wrong to you. They did you wrong. They criticized instead of affirmed. Maybe you weren't properly celebrated for your service. And now you've thrown in the, 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 the proverbial spiritual towel. And the blessing of God has passed you by. And I think if you look very clearly, if you look very deeply, you can trace it back to that moment when you got off track. I just want to concur that they had no right to talk to you like that. But becoming sour and bitter and cynical, allowing your soul to be curdled, begs the question, are you serving God or are you serving people? Are you serving God or are you serving people? The pain is real. The pain is real when we are, when, when our actions are misinterpreted. But we are all responsible for our own conduct. Verse five. And so if you're off track, get back on track. If you need healing, step into healing. Ask for it. The Father is generous with his kindness toward you. Verse six. And this section, I'm calling it generosity versus stinginess. Verses six to 10. Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. I'm just gonna stop there because immediately all of us go to, yep, you gotta pay, pay the pastors. Okay, so that's part of it. But there's a bigger thing going on here. See, what happens when you sit there and I stand here is that it can be very segregated. You're there, and you might have even checked in on social media this morning and said, I checked in at Restore Church. But then you checked out when you sat down. The potential's there. I'm not saying you did, but the potential's there. You can actually check in and then sit and check out until I'm done speaking. Here's the thing. True fellowship is you check in and you don't check out. True fellowship between me and you, whoever's up here and whoever's in the seats, true fellowship is when we're leaning both directions, when we're both giving and we're both receiving. So you may say, I'm just sitting here listening. No, you're not. I hope you're listening, but you're also, your engagement with me allows me to continue to feel the word that is coming, to continue to feel the spirit move in the room. Your role is significant. It is incredibly important. And we talk about living generously around here. That is one of the most generous gifts you can give is when you come in and you're engaged and you're leaning in. Verse seven, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. The word mock literally means turning up your nose. Turning up your nose against, in this case, God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own spiritual nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, and whenever the word therefore appears, it refers to what just was said. So if we're going to reap a harvest of blessing, 
Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. God's principle of grace means that he blesses us despite us, not because of us. He doesn't bless us because we made a deal with him. He blesses us because he's already made a deal through Christ. Because of Christ, we live, not because of performance. And if you're tempted to move toward legalism, if you're tempted to move toward performance, if you're tempted to doing the right things to receive the blessing of God, just know that religion is one of Satan's primary trump cards. Religion is a trump card of Satan. He will use that to to bring you to a place where you are all about performance instead of about living into the calling of God on your life. I don't know about uh, if you guys know this, but Jordan uh, Kearns, one of our pastors, he, uh, he is a man of many interests. And one of his interests that emerged this fall was uh, the whole thing of farming. And he fancies himself a bit of a rancher or a farmer, but he lives in a subdivision. And I'm not sure how that all works. So he made friends with a, a Carl, who, is a, who farms, I don't know, thousands of acres. And the perspective that Jordan got from sitting in the tractor and watching what happens when you plant in the spring and then have a crop in the fall. That was a substantial learning. That was a new experience. You know, you put a garden out, you know, a lot of us have gardens, and we may plant some carrots and we plant some potatoes, and at the end of the year or the end of the growing season, we expect to get carrots and potatoes. But when you're talking about being a, a farmer where your livelihood depends on making sure you plant in due season and that you harvest before this happens, the snow happens. And if you don't plant at the right time, you won't harvest at the right time. And Paul apparently is speaking to an agrarian society here because he uses this, this picture of planting and harvesting. And it is a, there are financial implications here, and there are straight up how we live implications here. So let's keep going. In verse uh, verse 9, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. See, here, Paul is not saying physical tiredness. He's talking about spiritual tiredness. He's talking about getting weary in well-doing. Don't get weary. He's saying, uh, have persistence, have grit. Doesn't, even though things get difficult, be persistent, have grit, stick to it, don't give up. This is Paul's word to the church in Galatia and it's his word to us this morning. And in verse 10, I just wanna remind us that the opportunity is now. The opportunity is now. We often think about eternity somewhere, sometime far away. But I'm convinced that eternity starts right now. Eternity starts right now. The way that we live right now will inform the way that we live in eternity. And so we ought to be about doing good to everyone that we come into contact with. Followers of Jesus, we we look out for the welfare of those around us. We don't gossip. We care about others' reputations. We are... We are generous with the, the, the um, benefit of a doubt. We are spirit-filled believers, and when we are, we believe the best and expect good and godly results. And we're going to go out of our way to do the best for others. This is the hallmark of a follower of Jesus, and this is what Paul is pointing to in Galatians 6. Pay attention, he says. Look out for the good of others. Because this is what counts. This is what counts. Starting in verse 12. Those who are trying to force you to be circumcised, they just want to look good to others. They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone can save. And even those who advocate circumcision don't keep the whole law themselves. They only want you to be circumcised so they can boast about it and claim you as their disciples. When you combine pride and cowardice, 
That's a dangerous mix and it attacks grace every single time. Here, there are ulterior motives to the work of the Judaizers. They're more interested in converts than in conversion. I hope we never find ourselves in a place where we want converts. We want the numbers, but we don't have the conversion. We must be people of the way. And when we're people of the way of Jesus, we are changed from the inside out. We love well. We serve well. We connect with people. We come alongside people when they have slidden off the road, the spiritual road. Their spiritual journey is a mess. We come alongside them and we look out for those around us. The danger is the propensity toward religion simply means that we keep adding something to the cross, like the cross plus good works, the cross plus baptism, the cross plus something, always something, something, and the next thing. God's system, though, is Christ plus nothing. I love this scripture from Romans 5. It speaks to this so succinctly. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. How grateful we can be for the work of Christ on the cross. Reading now from verse 15. And here's the clincher. It doesn't matter whether we've been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we've been transformed into a new creation. May God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle. They are the new people of God. Regeneration, new creation. Its presence or its absence, that really is the indicator of whether or not we're committed to follow, to follow Jesus. I'm convinced this morning that the cross can do what all the good works in the world could never do. Doing, doing and following the rules will never change your life, but the cross does. Religious rites do not impress God. Church membership or baptism do not impress God. If you want to impress God, follow Jesus. Follow the way of love. Paul was working hard to bring the Galatians into alignment. He heard all about how self-absorbed they were. He found them to be confused living in chaos, doing instead of claiming what was done already. They were living with a loss of freedom and not with the intention that was theirs when they first came to faith. How about you? How about you this morning? Are you living with the intention that you first had when you came to faith? Where do you find yourself? How are you doing with your coming alongside others? Are you making time for that to happen? Would you stand with me? We've spent the past six weeks uh, considering the word from this absolutely essential passage of scripture that calls us into a life of freedom. Not a freedom to, uh, I can do anything I want. Not a freedom to submit to our human nature. But the freedom to live into the beautiful life of following Jesus. The freedom that calls us to keep in step with the spirit. Because that brings out the best in all of us.